It's Vancouver's podcast on the Canada's Podcast Network. Gifty Survey Dunn founded She Butter Market in 2003 to create an all-natural beauty product while supporting widows and their families in Ghana to climb out of poverty. Gifty believes that her business is a force for the good and by doing business right means that everyone benefits. From the widows in Ghana who make the she butter for a premium price to the consumers who buy her high quality products. Well, Gifty, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time today to be here for all our listeners. Thanks very much, Robert, for having me. Great. Okay, I want you to tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, and give us the details on your current business. Ah, thank you. Well, I was born and raised in Ghana, in northern Ghana specifically, from a small town called Wa, W-A it's spelled. And uh, I was invited to visit some family friends in Canada a long, long time ago in 1981. And whilst I was here, I mean, soon after I arrived here, there was a military coup in Ghana. And uh, my father had been successful in business. He had a construction business that was thriving. And during that coup, uh, business people were target. And uh, so my father felt that um, it was, since I was in Canada and was safe, I should stay. So the family I was visiting with and my father made arrangements for me to stay in Canada and the rest has been history. I've been here since. I always had strong attachment to home though and uh, I always wanted to go back to Ghana and live in Ghana and uh, somehow the universe decided that that was not the way it was to be. I ended up meeting and marrying a Canadian man and settled in um, in British Columbia. We used to live, we met in Ottawa and then we moved to BC. And uh, he ended up doing some work in Ghana. And over the years, you know, we when when he got his work in Ghana, we traveled there often. And because I'd always wanted to be home and I was always interested in doing work with women and children, I would uh, keenly observe what was going on with the women. And uh, I had a sense of guilt because I felt like I needed to be there to be helping. And I was living in Canada. So every time we went, I brought stuff, you know, tchotchkes. I bring all kinds of stuff. And one year I was home and I was ready, we were ready to come back. And I asked what I could bring the next year when we visited. And one of the elders said to me, you know what, we don't want anything. We just want to work. And I thought, oh, well, you know what? I, they don't have no idea where I live. There's no way I can provide work. Uh, but because my background was in um, wanting to do something for home and make a difference, it really bothered me that um, I hadn't really reflected well on not bringing stuff or that it was also, um, I was thinking of me, I was using my guilt to try and help the women and that was very misplaced. So the question of uh, the issue of wanting to create work for them really sat with me and it bothered me. So over the years, I noticed that uh, shea butter was popular in North America, was becoming popular in North America. And the light bulb went up one evening when I was watching TV and saw that Nivea had shea butter in their products and it was advertised. And I thought, you know what? All those women who spoke to me that day, they all make shea butter. What if? What if I sold shea butter in North America? Would I not create work? So I got very excited and I don't have a bit, didn't have a business background. And so I always say that my business was really inspired by those women in my home. And that's how I came to start uh, selling shea butter. So I started off just wholesaling shea butter and it wasn't going great. So I decided then that uh, I would, well, inspired by my husband the second time around said, well, you know, it's North America. Uh, most people are not making this stuff. Why don't you make a, start a skincare line? And I thought, really, I have no idea. But again, fortunately, living on Vancouver Island, where there's so much creativity, so many people making soaps, doing stuff, 
I found a huge network of people who were willing to help me. And incidentally, it was through a friend uh, who had a shop and worked with a woman in Vancouver who was an aromatherapist. I got connected with her, and uh, she taught me to make products, and I launched Shea Butter Market. Okay, did you need financing to start your company, and how do you currently make money in the business now? Uh, so I have needed finance. I did need finances. At the start, our family financed it, and as time went on, uh, I was very fortunate to be connected with RBC, with the Royal Bank, and had incredible support uh, from the bank. And uh, I got some financing from the bank, and also not just financing, incredible advice. And so that helped me greatly to get uh, to get going. And since since uh, over time, I have had um, customers, really wonderful customers. And through some of our projects and contracts, we've been able to to refinance uh, from some of the sales that we've done. Okay, what but is the? But the RBC was incremental i mean is very helpful in getting me going right okay now what is the long-term vision and what will your company look like in the future do you see the company expanding into other areas and where beyond vancouver bc or even canada well for sure i think we're internet we're an international family we have international suppliers and so i want to see i would like to see the company doing more more with the women in africa in ghana specifically and also i have had interest from several countries in africa people asking me to make products for them to market currently we have some customers in the uk and uh, we want to start to see our customers uh, expand within the EU and particularly Africa. We're looking at the Middle East as well. Yeah, so we want to go global. Great. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Vancouver and, and doing business uh, throughout BC, actually, since you're over there on the island. Yes. What are the biggest yes. benefits for you and being an entrepreneur here in British Columbia? I want you to give us some of the good points about starting a company here, but I also want you to give us some of the tough things or challenges for our listeners so they can keep an eye out for them. Yeah, well, fantastic. Great question. I have found living on Vancouver Island, as I alluded to before, incredible support, incredible knowledge. You know, I started off in my kitchen and, and I had to call on people. I had no idea about making products. But as I said, there are a lot of people on this island who are so knowledgeable. One of my girlfriends is a herbalist and I'm constantly calling upon her for, for help. Uh, that has been been wonderful. And also attitudes, you know, the attitudes on Vancouver Island is we want to buy local. Uh, we want to do lots in our community. I have had extensive support from, from the community in general and really, uh, really healthy attitude towards the work that I'm doing, great deal of support. One of the biggest challenges of being on the island and working from the island is that we have to bring so much in. The cost of doing business here is quite steep. You know, I have to bring the shea butter from Ghana. It comes to Vancouver and then gets trucked here. And uh, when I buy essential oils, a lot of what I, the resources I use in my business are coming from elsewhere. So that can be very costly. That is one of the challenges. But it's a challenge that we manage and, and we overcome. Okay, great. Now, we do some of our best work outside the office. Is there a place in on Vancouver Island close to where you live or work where you like to go recharge or get inspired with ideas or just think about your business? And does it change with the well, season considering all the rain we get in on the island? Well, uh, the beach, the little beach in Mill Bay, I live in Mill Bay, we have a beautiful beach that is sometimes so quiet. I can, there are times when I can go on the beach and I'd be the only one there with my dog. I love to take my dog on the beach. He loves the beach. And we have a, a little corner that we sit and I meditate and reflect and he plays on the beach. Yeah, so we've got that. We've been, we're very blessed. 
even when it's raining, you know, even even in the rain, all you, you have to dress up for it. So I put on my uh, rain jacket and I go out in the rain and uh, same spot and it's really lovely. There are times when uh, the tide is too high and I can't go on the beach, but we have incredible trails on the island. I love to go to Cobble Hill Mountain with my dog again and uh, uh, really friendly people. People are very helpful if I get stuck with well, something happens happens with a dog, there's always somebody there. So I'm very fortunate to be living in paradise, really. Great. Okay. Now, we have a lot of international listeners, so this next question, I want you to speak to them. If you were to start all over again, and you just moved here to Vancouver Island, but this time you don't know anyone, knowing what you know now, what would you do, and how would you go about starting all over again as an entrepreneur? Huh. Wow, a little bit of reflection required here. Um, knowing what I know now, my approach to the business would have been a little different. Where I would have chosen to market my products would have been different uh, because I think it would have been a little more lucrative. You know, I, I did, I mean, the health food sector has been really great for me. However, it was slow going. And now that I know a little more about the island, I have found so many wonderful spars on the island and I might have started there and might have built up my capital a lot quicker if I had gone that route. Uh, so knowing what I know now, uh, that's where I would have started. There's not much else I would have changed. I think I would have still gone into business. Yeah, travel can be a challenge. Uh, but again, everything is manageable and uh, we just make it work. I mean, knowing what I know now, I think that a lot more planning goes into working from from this island. You know, you, you I wasn't much of a planner until I got into, do, into doing this business. And I have found that I have to plan a great deal uh, because I'm, I'm far away from most of what I need. Uh, and so it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of planning. And uh, but with with uh, with the technology that we have now, it is easy to be connected. I don't feel I don't feel isolated. Perhaps I've come across as so, but really I am not. I have uh, Skype. I have Zoom. I have I'm really very well connected with the people that I need to be connected to. So it, it's not it's not too bad. It's not too hard to do business from here. OK, let's talk a little bit about your routine. What does the first hour look like for you when you get up in the morning? Do you have a specific routine or a ritual that helps you get motivated to start your day? I do have a routine. I again, prayer. I start off with a prayer. Uh, and then the next thing is after I've had my cup of tea, I'm not a coffee drinker, I'm a tea drinker, I hit the beach with my dog. And you know, my dog is my, he's such a great teacher. Oftentimes I'm in a hurry and the dog always reminds me to slow down because he's gonna, I have a Rhodesian Ridgeback and when he decides, very strong-willed, uh, very stubborn. And so if he decides to stop and sniff at a, at a shrub, he is going to do it. And, and I have to say to myself, yes, you know, we really do have to stop and smell the roses. And my dog is reminding me of that. So I start off with, I start my morning with that meditation, with that reminder. Because in business, we often, you know, we're in a rush. We're rushing all the time uh, to get stuff done. And my dog really helps me set the tone for the day. But yes, I want to be effective and I want to be efficient, but I have to remember that I live in the universe and I have to take it easy and I have to have balance. And, I, and, and my dog helps me do that. So that, that is the way I start my day. Do you think entrepreneurs have to be weird or unique in a positive way or are wired differently? I really think so. I think that uh, we have to be, entrepreneurs have to be positive because I, I say to my friends often that if you're afraid of no, if you're afraid of hearing no, don't bother getting into business because that's, that, is, that is something we hear very, very frequently. And sometimes people throw no at you with a whole bunch of negative uh, baggage 
and uh, package. It comes wrapped in a big package of no and can be so depressing and such a downer. And so you have to have a positive attitude and be open to hearing it and be hope, actually open to t taking a no, that big package of no, and turn it into yes. That is one of the things that I think, I, for me anyway, I have found to, to help. Uh, and I think only way to do it is to have a positive attitude and not to really personalize a lot of the negativity that comes at one uh, uh, so, so often. Yes. You know, I can have days that I just know these and uh, I, I take them as they come and I take them with the attitude that, well, you know, this is just for now. It's going to be it's going to be yes tomorrow. And I think the only way to do so is to have that positive attitude. Yes, there's a famous quote that says for every no, that means you're just getting one step closer to a yes. So, yeah, yeah you just got to keep that in mind. OK, yes. what what books are you reading now and why or even audio books? And can you recommend any books for our listeners who are also aspiring entrepreneurs? Uh, actually, I'm reading. I, I just I just picked up Kofi Annan's book. Um, I don't know if you, uh, people, um, well, international listeners, and most most of our listeners are probably familiar with uh, Kofi Annan, our UN Secretary General, who just passed away two weeks ago, or two or three weeks ago, and uh, he was from Ghana. So I'm, I'm looking at the world now and, and uh, looking at the world as in, you know, we are one small global village. I actually, it's so funny, I can't, the title of the book has just escaped me right now, uh, but it's Kofi Annan's last book. And uh, I picked it up. I haven't even opened it. I put it aside to read. I'm going to be traveling next week. And when I go, it's the one that I want to take with me. And uh, the other one that I haven't started and want to read because I just uh, uh, finished watching the, the, well, I watched last week the funeral of John McCain and uh, want to pick up For Whom the Bell Tolls. I had read it in, in high school in Ghana. And uh, so when it came up in the services, I thought, you know what, it's time to pick that up again. Okay, any online or offline tools that you like to use on a daily basis? Um, so the online tools that um, I use on a daily basis, of course, my, my, my teenage son tells me I'm old and I keep using email. I do email very, very often. I mean, because I'm, I'm talking to people all over the world. Um, I don't know if WhatsApp uh, um, qualifies as one of them, but I'm on WhatsApp constantly uh, because I'm dealing with people in Africa and a majority of people at home are on, on WhatsApp. And so I use it often. Okay. Um, any uh, offline tools that you use, like uh, pen and paper? Pen and paper all the time. I'm so old-fashioned that way. I uh, use pen and paper all the time. I'm, I'm actually more of a pen and paper uh, woman than I am uh, online, aside from, of course, WhatsApp. But I love pen and paper. Okay. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you like to do for a profession? If I weren't doing, I have asked myself often now what I would be doing. And sometimes I say to myself, I really can't think of something, anything else I could be doing but this. However, I have to adjust that a little bit and say that I've always, I have a background in conflict management. And uh, I look at some of the conflicts that are going on around the world, and I often say to myself, you know what, especially when I hear of the babies crying and I think, oh, my God, I wish I could do something about that. Uh, and so I would probably do work in conflict management and probably do work with the United Nations in addressing some of the conflicts that the world is facing. Things are getting better on the African continent, uh, I think. Uh, but that's something that I would probably have done. Women and children are dear to my to my soul, and I would like to. I would have been doing work that would address the situation. What kind of a job would you not like to do? Couldn't do it. I couldn't do. I couldn't work. I couldn't be a nurse. 
I could not be a nurse because uh, I would be an emotional baggage. I would I would bring I would bring uh, patients home all the time, and I think I would kill myself in the process, as in emotionally uh, drain myself. So I couldn't. I admire healthcare healthcare pro professionals greatly because I could not do that. In business, what is your favorite word, quote, or sentence that you like to use? My favorite, my favorite uh, word is "do not give up." Do Sent not give up. Uh, is that a is that a sentence? That's a it? sentence. It's a quote sentence. It's yeah. A, it, yeah, yeah. That's a, just just don't give up. Just don't give up. I keep saying that. Just don't give up. And okay. uh, it's one that I could spend hours unpacking because that's been my experience. That many times when I reflect on the journey that I've been on, uh, many times I was tempted to give up and I didn't. And now I'm seeing such positive results with hanging in there. And uh, yeah, so that's one that I would love to share. Don't give up. What is your least favorite word or sentence you do not like to hear? Oh, God. What is my least? Um, it's not possible. Oh, I hate that when people say, well, it's not possible. You can't do that. Everything is possible. So I don't like to hear it's not possible. Okay. If you had to pick one or two words to describe yourself, what would it be and why? Well, <laughs> positive. Positive is one. I am very po optimistic. Optimistic is a better one. I am very, very optimistic, and I stay put, uh, optimistic because I think it's good, it's good for my soul. I feel good when I feel positive, so positive, yes. Okay. What keeps you up at night, if anything? Uh, financial strain. Financial collapse and um, failure of the business because I feel that there's so many people depending on my success and I depend on their success as well. And I think that if I were to give up, I would um, not only disappoint, but um, stop the kind of poverty alleviation I'm able to do with my business. So that worries me. Sometimes when I, I panic, that is what I panic about. If we don't do well, so many people will not do well. Yeah. Okay. I want you to give us the top three things on your inspired life list. This could be a bucket list of any sort, whether you want to travel more, whether you want to do philanthropy, a TEDx talk, write a book, anything like that? Well, you, you hit on some of them. Travel more, I have a lot of connect connections all over the world. And I would like to go around the world and see all my friends and family uh, sometime. So that's on my bucket list. And uh, I also want to do more philanthropy. One of the things that I would like to do, would like to use this business to do, is help educate more children in my community. I have always said that if I were to do extremely well, I would like to set up a foundation for educating children in my communi community in Ghana and particularly young girls. So that's on my bucket list. And the third is I'm often encouraged to write a book about my experiences uh, doing this business and just experiences having had to leave home, leave Ghana at a young age. And that my life experience leaving home and being in Canada and having all my family in Ghana, uh, I hear would make an interesting book. So maybe one day. Okay. Do you have any advice that you may have received that you can pass on to entrepreneurs throughout BC? Yes, I, uh, the, the one that sticks out clearly in my mind always, I have so many, I have received so many, but one that I'd like to pass on at this stage is listen to your banker. 
I, miss, I, I tell the story of years ago when I first started the business and I was doing extremely well. And uh, one of the bankers I worked with uh, at RBC in Milby uh, encouraged me to inc increase my line of credit. And I said to him, oh, no, 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 I cannot do that. I'm afraid of debt. I don't ever want to, I don't want to take on more debt. I don't want debt. And he said, well, you're doing well now. And I think it's a good idea. If you don't use it, you don't use it, but you have it. And typical, typical of a Ghanaian, I wasn't going to do it I, because it, it, it just smacked of more debt. I didn't do it. And you would know it years, a few years after this conversation, the markets crashed and the business suffered greatly. And I wasn't able to get more credit as easily as I would have at that time. And that's always stuck with me. And I've always said, you know what, I should have listened at to this wonderful banker. He had my interest in mind and uh, I did not listen and it's one that I regret. And so um, listen to your banker and take some of advice, some of the financial advice they give because they know what they're talking about. I didn't know anything about that stuff and I didn't listen. So now do you, uh, I regret that. Do you use a financial advisor now in addition to bankers? I do. I do. It's certainly I do. Uh, my my business account manager at RBC has just been absolutely wonderful. And not just him, all the staff, all the... Oh, that's the wonderful thunder and lightning. Yeah, we're going through a little bit of a storm here today. So. Wow, wow. Anyway, yes, all my all my uh, my financial advisors, that's including the the staff at RPC, and my my business manager has been just fabulous. And yes, I I, I feel like I'm in this business with them, uh, because I I know deep down that they want me to succeed, and they've been very supportive of uh, seeing me to the end, and, and uh, I feel very fortunate for that. Okay, Gifty. And of course, my family has been incredible. Yeah. Are Sorry. You, yeah, are you, ready to have some, are you ready to have some fun? I'm ready to have some fun. Okay, great. Okay, as you know, entrepreneurs are very, very busy people. Earlier you said that you got, you're talking to people from all over the world, and uh, you're on WhatsApp, you're on your phone all the time, but we're going to take you away from all that. There's a small tropical island just off of Fiji that only has one phone booth there. There is no internet. This place does exist. We're going to drop you off there. You won't have a computer or a smartphone or a tablet. You can use the phone booth located there any time to call the boat. We'll come pick you up. How long would you last before you made that call? And what would you do while you were there? Hmm. So it depends on if there are people there with me. Because I'm a people person, if there are people there with me, I will last about two, probably 10 days, and then I would start thinking, oh, I gotta go back and work. Uh, but if there are not too many people with me, uh, again, with, because I'm a people person, if there are no people there, I will feel very isolated. However, I would want to rest. And I think that uh, I will meditate. I will walk quite a bit, and I don't think that I will last more than uh, five days doing that. Um, yeah, because I am not an isolationist. And uh, I, I think after, th after three days, I would be well rested, and then I might do two days of uh, just doing nothing, then it'd be time to go home. Time to call the boat, we'll come that pick is, you up. Yeah. If there are no people there, then it'd be time to go. Okay. Okay, Gifty, how can our listeners get hold of you? And is there anything you would like to add before you leave us today? I would like to uh, add that I am super, super grateful for the opportunity to be heard and to share. And uh, I can people can reach me through my website, uh, info at Shea Butter Market or www.sheabuttermarket.com. And uh, what I would like to add is that, you know, we can all make a difference. You, my customers say to me, oh, you're so brave to be doing this business. Oh, you're so talented. I don't think that's what it is. I think that I, I, I was fortunate to discover that I can make a difference. And, and I, I know that when people participate in, in what we're doing in, and in what others are doing, they do make a difference. 
And, and that's what uh, I would like to share with everybody, that in, in, in the things that we're doing, if we do it with the community in mind and in heart, we do make a difference. And uh, to just keep going. Okay. Don't give up. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I've learned a lot about you, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, great. We'll see you next time.